Hi there, welcome to a uh, summer short for 29th of August. Uh, thanks for joining me. We're going to have a short time of prayer, then we're going to look at a part of the Bible, read through the, the Bible passage, and then spend some time reflecting it. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time to, to reflect on your word, to, to think more deeply about who you are and what you have done for us. Lord, we ask that as we spend this time focused on you, you would open our hearts and minds to all you have to teach us this morning. Amen. So as Jesus taught us, I'm going to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to the temple, came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting out in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what the children are saying? they asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never heard? From the lips of children and infants you have called forth praise. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany, where he spent the night. I wonder where you think of uh, authority being placed uh, in the world. Who has the authority? Who, who would you listen to? If someone told you to jump, who would you respond uh, by saying how high? Where does authority lie? Well, in the, the Bible passage that we've just read and in the beginning of chapter 21 as a whole, uh, Matthew demonstrates Jesus' uh, willingness uh, after uh, years of ministry to begin to, to demonstrate and manifest his authority. Uh, Jesus has just entered um, on the donkey, he's entered as the king and had the, the crowds shouting Hosanna for the son of David, calling him, you know, the coming saviour king. And now uh, we see him enter the temple and we're going to explore now how Jesus um, sort of describes his authority um, over the temple and as the new temple. Uh, but before we dive into what uh, the passage here actually says, there's probably some uh, what we should know, some, some other information around about um, our reading that we need to understand in order to sort of fully grasp what uh, Jesus is doing here. Uh, and the first is a bit of history, and um, I'm really grateful to the people who write books on these things, because I just read up on this recently, didn't know it before. Um, but it seems now that... Um, the traders hadn't always been in the temple courts, in the court of the Gentiles. So if you imagine, uh, if you've not come across the temple uh, in Jesus' time, there was uh, sort of shells of um, uh, allowing people inness, there you go, that's a word, uh, around the temple. So only the, the priests um, could go into the, the centre and then there was an area for Jewish people and outside an area where Gentiles. So. It's not that only Gentiles are in the courts of the Gentiles, but only, the Gentiles can only go into this bit of the temple. So if they want to worship, they've got to worship there. Um, and it's a really big area. So 33 acres, um, which according to um, the book I was reading about this, that's six Trafalgar squares. So it's a really large area. The circumference, so if you want to walk around the edge of it, it's a mile long walk. So we're talking about a really large space. Uh, and this is where Gentiles can worship, as we said, and it's also an area with colonnades, so places with shade. So it's where a lot of the teaching um, would have gone on. So if you remember um, your other sort of New Testament Jesus stories, you know, Jesus is a, as an, as a 12 year old probably who's um, he's got lost in the temple uh, area. The, his parents wander back off to their home and forget that he's still in Jerusalem, get a little bit lost and confused because they've probably got quite a few kids. But yeah, Jesus stays there. So understand that Jesus growing up has been in these areas and he's uh, been taught in these areas 
and over the last few years, probably just slightly before Jesus' public ministry, um, there's been a decision to make to move all the traders off the Mount of Olives, where, um, which is one of the main routes into Jerusalem, so a reasonable place for the market to be is you're going into Jerusalem to go to the temple for the first time. Uh, you change your money because you can only um, buy um, sac animals for sacrifice with the temple money and you can only pay your temple tax which is about to come due with the temple money so you change your money you buy your animals for sacrifice and then you go up into the temple but now they've shifted all of that off the mount of olives and impl into the the sort of the outer courts the gentile areas of the temple and the sanhedrin the sort of the the governing parliament had rejected that as an idea but they've been overruled by the high priests uh, Caiaphas uh, and so what is about to happen can be seen very much as a, a personal challenge from Jesus against the high priest decision to um, force his will that the, the traders should be in the temple. I, I'm cynical about Caiaphas because it doesn't seem like a great guy um, in my mind it was a good way of making money for the temple to have all the trading going on within the temple but I'm not evidence for that, it's just what my mind assumes uh, when I see it. So the historical context is one in which it's a new thing, it's a not um, necessarily universally accepted or welcomed thing um, and it's definitely something that Jesus would have seen as it was before and his challenge to it uh, is a challenge that will be def directly received by the high priest. So that's the sort of the historical stuff that we should know. Um, the Bible stuff we should know is some, is some Old Testament readings. The first from Malachi 3, 1-4, uh, which says, I will send my messenger, who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a laundress soap. He will set as a refiner a purifier of sil silver. He will purify the Levites uh, and refine them like gold or silver. So the Levites, the, the order from which the priests are taken, the tribe from which the priests are taken, the people responsible for the running of the temple. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be accepted to the Lord as in days gone by, as in the former days. So this is a prophecy where um, the servant of the Lord, the, the messenger uh, of God, will come in and refine the worship within the temple, bring purity back to the temple worship. Uh, and then Zechariah 14, 21, uh, Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty, and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day there will no longer be a merchant in the house of the Lord Almighty. Now the word merchant, it's a bit of, um, not entirely clear how it should be translated, it could also be Canaanite, uh, but what seems clear is that um, the day of the Lord will, bring, will be seen with uh, temple worship uh, having any sort of, any extraneous thing, anything that might be considered uh, less than fully holy, removed, uh, and the idea of trade would be included within that idea of less than fully holy. Take that as you will, but that's what they're saying. And then finally, as a bit of context, uh, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus himself has already said, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. So Jesus is acting out his earlier statement. So he said, I'm greater than the temple, and now he's manifesting that statement along with the words of Malachi and the words of Zechariah. Um, Jesus hasn't just turned up and lost his temper because change has been made. Jesus is declaring his, you know, I am the person these Old Testament stories were talking about. I have told you that I'm greater than the temple, that there's something greater than the temple that is me. And now I'm demonstrating that by the way I'm speaking and acting within the temple. And so we understand the events here in the beginning of chapter 21. Um, are seen as a, as a direct challenge to the authority of, first of all, the civil leaders in the way Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem as the Messianic King, and now here uh, a challenge to the leaders in the temple as he comes in. Uh, and actually, when we look in detail at, at what happens here, um, 
we can see that it's it's perhaps not the it's not sort of hundreds of people over two weeks blocking the center of London. Uh, what we see here is uh, Jesus seemingly on his own uh, comes into the the temple courts, which we said is a really large area. Uh, presumably, uh, Jerusalem during Passover, the population that's not like triples, so it's going to be full of people, full of traders. It's unlikely then we should read all as Jesus covers the entire area of six Trafalgar squares, clearing every single stall out. Um, what seems more likely is that Jesus it can clears out all the ones he can reach. Um, it seems reasonable to expect that the money traders would be near the entrance to the to the area. Um, because you've got to change your money before you can go shopping, as it were. Um, and so Jesus says, has scattered out a large number of people, enough to sort of arouse the, the interest and the condemnation of the Jewish authorities, but not so much as to have the Roman soldiers outside the temple feel they have to come in, which is what happened when there was a riot with Paul in Acts when he was attacked. So we know the Romans would come in if they thought there was a riot going on. So it's somewhere between nothing and a major riot, if that's helpful for us to understand. So Jesus has come in, he's made a significant um, disturbance in the marketplace. And as he's challenged, he quotes these two uh, Old Testament readings. First, Isaiah 56, 7, and then Jeremiah 7, 11, A place that should be a place of worship has now become... Uh, a place uh, of trade. Uh, Den of Robbers is literally a bandit's cave. Um, so it's not so much the, the traders are being attacked as robbers, because it's more the place rather than the people. So it's no longer a place of worship, it's a place full of stuff. Um, bandit's cave, you know, like a, in my mind that goes to the sort of story of Aladdin and the 40 Thieves. The idea that this is a place where a bunch of stuff has been left. Um, so you've taken, should be one thing, and you've made it into another thing, and that other thing means that you can no longer worship there. So it's not a long protest, it's more a sudden and direct uh, shock to the authority of the temple leaders. So I think if, the t if all Jesus did that day was knock over some tables, if that's all he was, was a, like a rabble rouser, a protester, I think the story would have remained there, but that's that's only half the story. Uh, having made this sort of commotion, challenged this new uh, and less than status quo, Jesus uh, stays there and we're told that the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. And the language Matthew uses here is really specific. Uh, we're often told of people coming to Jesus for, for healings, and generally we're either told very specifically or in more in very general terms. So it's either a specific, here's the story about this one individual, or and a whole list of people came and he healed them. Uh, here, Matthew uses language very specifically, the blind and the lame. And it seems like he wants us to, to be aware of um, one, uh, 2 Samuel 5 verse 8 and the verses around there. Uh, and here King David says, the blind and the lame will not enter uh, the the palace. Uh, so uh, David has just conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites after becoming king and um, they've taunted him because they think they're safe in Jerusalem. The, you know, the blind and the lame could keep you out. So once he conquers them he says, now the blind and the lame aren't welcome. It's sort of, it's not a great thing to be saying but um, it's a sign that although David is a good king he's still a human king. He's still making bad choices. And so Matthew wants us to see that that this new king, this new David, he is he's no longer bound by the weaknesses of humanity. He's no longer being spiteful. He's come in and he's made this big statement of being Davidic, uh, the Davidic king and the you know the great high priest. And now he's doing what David could never do. He's more than he's more than a new king. And so the children. Uh, in that uncomfortable manner that children have of just speaking the truth no matter what the consequences, just see the truth that here, here he is, Hosanna, the saviour, the new saviour king. Just speak that truth out. And the temple authorities, they cannot see that truth. What is so plain and evidence to the children, 
and that this guy is something special, they cannot see it. And they react indignantly and they ask Jesus to refute um, the truth that the children are speaking. Have you heard it? And Jesus went, yeah, I've heard it. And then he quotes um, Psalm 8 verse 3. And in Psalm 8, you know, Yahweh, God, the Almighty, is calling forth praise from the, from the children. And Jesus quotes the Almighty calling forth praise from children and uses it to justify the children praising him now. So he's saying that the children did in verse in that psalm where they called forth praise because you know God called forth praise from them that's what's happening here. God is calling forth praise from the children and it's it's by me and it's for me. You know Jesus has been traveling and ministering for years at this point keeping his uh, the, the true nature of his identity uh, a secret encouraging those he's healed not to talk about it because he doesn't want to be forced into being just a human king he needs them he needs to get to this point of challenge but at this point of challenge now his the full nature of his authority and his personhood and his divinity can be can be spoken of and here is Jesus declaring you know i deserve praise like god deserves praise because and the sentence doesn't need to be finished uh, and finally, the day ends with Jesus on his own terms. He, he chooses when to leave. He goes over to Bethany where he and the disciples are staying for the week, you know, probably an hour long walk. And so we see this great sort of day of, of Jesus declarating his civil authority and his spiritual authority and saying, look, I'm God. And just leaving people to think about that that means um, to us because we don't worship in the temple we don't live in Jerusalem um, but we do live in an age when authority is universally questioned unless it's something we agree with um, so if we don't like something we question the authority of the person has set we no longer live in a culture of deference where well if the leaders of the country have said it even though we don't like it we'll do it that, those days are uh, currently far away from us but Jesus here says that he has all the civil authority and that he has all the spiritual authority for us then the word of God as received over two millennia uh, by Jesus's faithful followers it, that is where authority lies it can't be altered or set aside by anyone in government it can't be ignored or redefined by anyone uh, in leadership within the church, you know, that word is still the place where our authority lies, not in uh, any attempt to, to see a different truth. Uh, that's just not truth. Jesus here is saying, it's about me. It's not about what you think uh, or what you feel, temple leaders. And I think it's really important that having said Jesus is the one where all the authority lies, which can feel difficult to us because we live in this culture where authority is we suspect it but Matthew makes it clear in the center of this you know declaration of Jesus authority that Jesus is is not like even the best human leaders he's better than uh, in him there is there is new life in him there is restoration in him there is hope you know people come to him and receive all that they need he's not um, just another another king, another despot. And so I think for us it's really important that we give time in our lives to knowing uh, God's word, to trusting in him in the, the sort of the ordinary and the mundane. So when the, when the perhaps greater challenges uh, come in life, we have a firmer foundation of understanding what Jesus has said, understanding who he is and how much he loves us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you help us to, to remember that you are, you are our king. That if we want to be part of your kingdom, that means honouring you and serving you. Lord, we pray this week that we would know you more. That we would give time to worshipping you, to reading your word. Lord, that we would not be led astray but that we would sit on the foundation of your truth. Amen. Thank you again for joining me today and I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.